Welcome. My name is Anna Maria Giraldi. I'm the president on, of the ISSM, and I want to welcome you all to this webinar on sexual abuse in men. And I want to thank our education committee, chaired by Landon Trust from the US and Patricia Pasquale from Portugal, and the whole committee for taking responsibility and planning these webinars. For those of you who might not know the International Society for Sexual Medicine, it's our vision that every human being has the right to a healthy and satisfying sexual life. And we also have a mission to be the most respected and trusted source of information, education and professional development on human sexual health through the delivery of world-class publication, research findings online and in-person opportunities for knowledge exchange worldwide. And I think our webinars is a very good example of how we can fulfill one of these missions. The next slide, please. If you are not a member, you might become a member because if you're a member, you'll have the benefit of receiving our journals. We have three paper journals, sexual, the Journal of Sexual Medicine, Sexual Medicine Open Access and Sexual Medicine Reviews. And we also have our video journal. So they are all included in our membership. The next slide, please. As you know, we had to cancel our meeting due to the pandemic. It should have been in Japan last year. And this is why we started these webinars. And I must say they have been very, very successful. And again, today we have more than 100 people participating from all over the world. So it's a pleasure to welcome you all to uh, our webinars. And this webinar is the number 11 webinar of our series. So they have been running for almost a year now. If you have not participated in our previous webinars, you can go to our website and you'll find uh, the, the past webinars. You can still see them and you'll also find a schedule of our future webinars. The next slide, please. So after I've setting this, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator for this webinar, Stephen Braveman. Stephen is a licensed marriage and family therapist and an ASEC certified diplomat and supervisor of sex therapy. He has a private practice in California and actually told me before that he has always lived in California. He has started and maintained one of the first psychotherapy, uh, psychotherapy groups for adult males molesters as children in the US. He is also the creator of the first full length documentary on this subject. It was called Boyhood Shadows, I Swore I'd Never Tell. So it's really a specialist and thank you for you, Stephen, for agreeing to moderate this webinar. Welcome to you, Stephen. Thank you, appreciate that. So I will just want to note that uh, one in six is the estimate as far as how many boys are molested by the time they reach 18. That's a large percentage of the population that basically is unrecognized. So we have a great panel today who are going to be presenting on the subject and tell you a lot of details about this issue. In our program, we have first a discussion. Uh, each speaker will take 10 minutes and they will present their issues. After that, we will have a Q&A and we do ask that you write, use the Q&A feature on your Zoom room uh, to send in your messages, send in your requests. If you can name which speaker that you would like to ask the question to, that would be very helpful as well. And we'll again be taking those after the presentations. So I am very pleased to introduce our first speaker. Edred Geritz Maiden is a senior faculty member at the School of uh, at the School of Social Work at the University of Haifa in Israel, and is a certified sex therapist in practice and research. She focuses on human sexuality and particularly the sexual health of trauma survivors. So welcome, Ethra. Thank you, and hi, and hi to everyone. Well, from all over the world. Um, thank you for inviting me for this great webinar. Um, child sexual abuse of boys is, and especially the sexuality um, developing follow, following child sexual abuse of boys is very under discussed. So I think this webinar is very important. And I hope within my 10 minutes, I could just bring up some 
important things to consider when addressing the sexuality of male survivors of child sexual abuse. Um, so without further ado, uh, next um, slide. Um, previous research shows that child sexual abuse can impact the sexuality of survivors in two patterns. You see, it ranges from hypersexuality to hyposexuality. Hypersexuality refers to excessive pornography use and masturba excessive masturbation, risky sexual behaviors, um, sexual compulsivity. And the hyposexuality on the other side refers to undersexualization, such as low sexual desire, erectile dysfunction, um, et cetera. But both, it's important to say that both scenarios originate from the same place. The survivor does not want to encounter their anxiety, their helplessness, their fears related to sex. So one just shuts down their sexuality totally and they don't want to be reminded or triggered by anything that could maybe trigger the abuse or memories of the abuse. And the other one, um, so they engage in sexual behaviors to gain a sense of control um, in terms of like, I, I, I decide how much people I'm going to sleep with and, and what terms and how much sex I'm going to have, etc. But it's, it's a sense of control. Yeah, I could, I could elaborate on that later. But um, it's important also to say that hypersexual behaviors are usually soul behaviors, so that the survivor does not, it doesn't require the survivor to be engaging in any intimate situation or to be vulnerable um, within, within a relationship. Next slide. Please. So I just want to say, interestingly, there is much more studies on oversexualization of male survivors. Um, and I'll explain that later why. But a recent review that I conducted showed that many, many male survivors also experience hyposexuality. And it is interesting. Uh, it's not researched enough. Next slide, please. So just in a word, before I dive into talking about couples, the sexuality of survivors of child sexual abuse is a traumatized sexuality, okay? So many survivors experience dissociation and they, and which, which is a pattern that maybe helped them during the abuse to disconnect from their body in order to protect themselves, but it doesn't help them in their current sexual relationship. A lot of them experience intrusive thoughts during sex. Um, they are triggered by smells, by touch, by sights, or even by specific sexual activities that remind them of the abuse. Many of them avoid sex in general or avoid specific sexual activities, even pleasurable ones. Um, a lot of them have a lot, a lot of negative emotions towards sex. As, such as guilt, shame, anxiety, fear, disgust. And many of them have negative beliefs about one themselves. I'm bad, I'm unworthy of love. I can only be loved if I give sexual pleasures. And they have negative beliefs about others. The other will always use me. They can't be trusted. And they have negative beliefs about sex. So sex is harmful, disgusting, dangerous. Next slide. Given the complexity of traumatic sexuality, the question I think we are all asking is whether we should engage in couple or individual therapy. What is more efficient? What is more effective to treat sexual difficulties following child sexual abuse among males? So, I don't think there is a specific answer or a right or wrong answer. On the one hand, the majority of literature on sex therapy does suggest that engaging both partners in therapy is more efficient, but it's unclear if this recommendation is true when treating child sexual abuse survivors and considering their traumatic sexualization. On the other hand, most current treatments approaches for child sexual abuse are actually individualized. So there is no right or wrong answer to this and I'm gonna address some key points, but I can say from a clinical perspective that I, th I think it depends 
on whether the couple has a safe attachment or not. If we're asking the survivor to put themselves out there and to be vulnerable and to discuss their abuse, but then the partner is unattuned, unresponsive, we could kind of reenact specific aspects of the abuse and that, that could be really harmful. Next slide, please. So child sexual abuse among males, it strikes the core elements of male masculinity. So men ask them to, themselves, how was I abused? Why didn't I resist? Why wasn't I able to stop the abuse? The whole notion of being a victim does not align with what the society expect of men, right? We want them to be strong and assertive and powerful. And that's the, that's the society's narrative about men. And this can even be intensified when the, when the abuse occurs by a woman. And this can also explain why most of the studies on sexuality following child sexual abuse of males is about over-sexualization. Because male survivors, they explain that admitting to hypersexuality aligns with the societal norms of masculinity, right? Men always want sex and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't match up with the narrative of being a victim. So when we talk, this aspect of male masculinity makes couple therapy much more complicated because we do not, men don't put themselves out there. So you're adding this variable of a partner. So you're asking men, we're asking men to put themselves out there, to be vulnerable, to open up about their abuse, their feelings, their difficulties, and their sexual difficulties, which definitely does not align with the sexual script of, uh, of men, that they always want to have sex. Next slide. I just wanna put it out there that when one partner has a history of child sexual abuse, it is also very difficult for the other partner. So I didn't wanna neglect that part. Many partners of child sexual abuse, um, when they go into couple therapy, they feel like the sexual abuse overshadows everything in therapy, that they cannot express their emotions, their needs, their fears. They feel left out of the therapeutic process. They feel like their needs are not addressed. And they even feel really bad and guilty if they want sex. They say, well, as if I'm a perpetrator. They also fear they may lose their partner or hurt them if they express their sexual needs. But the saddest part is that many of them feel very much rejected by their partner's sexual withdrawal. So that is really hard. So just, we need to remember as therapists and researchers that the partner struggles as well. And the partner may not have a history of child sexual abuse, but they have attachment fears and attachment needs and we, we should not neglect them within the therapeutic setting. Next slide. So given all the complexities, couple therapy can be very beneficial. First, because it reframes the sexual issue, the sexual difficulties as a couple's issue. It's not the survivor's fault. It's something that happens to both, both of the couples. Second, child sexual abuse is a relational trauma. And therefore, it can and it maybe should be healed within a relationship. So even though there's the male narrative, se sexual scripts for male, and the masculinity idea, men need to learn <laughs> and to put themselves out there, to trust their partner, to lean on them, to ask for help, to show their, to show their vulnerability within a relationship. And if they do receive a supportive and responsive and attuned response from their partner, that can actually be an enactment within the therapeutic setting. And that can enable healing and impairment of early attachment injuries that were developed following the abuse. However, I'm just gonna finish with that. We do need to make sure that when we build the couple's foundation towards sexual, sexuality and intimacy, we, do not, we need to consider all the aspects of the abuse and make sure we do not replicate aspects of the abuse within the current relationship. And we got to navigate this really carefully. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andrea. So we are uh, getting questions in our Q&A and I want to remind everybody that we won't be answering them until the panel discussion is um, finished until they've all made their presentations, but do please send in your questions. We, we appreciate that and it's actually helpful for me to see what is coming in in advance. Our next speaker is Angelo Fernandez. Angelo is the founder and CEO of Cuebar O Silencio, and I know I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. The first and only Portuguese NGO that supports male survivors of sexual violence. Apart from the support services, Cuebar O Silencio works towards raising awareness of sexual violence against men and boys and trainings for professionals. In the first four years of activity, 371 men and boys have sought their services and received same. It's a great pleasure to welcome Angelo to our panel today. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you. Uh, I would like to start by thanking for the invitation uh, to be here and also to greet the other speakers. Uh, I think you said it almost perfectly, quebrar o silencio, so thank you for that, Stephen. Um, my name is Angel Fernandes, and I'm the founder and CEO of Quebrar o Silencio. Um, we, we basically are the first and only NGO, the Portuguese NGO, non-governmental organization, that supports male survivors, men and boys, that were sexually abused. Like Stephen said, in our first four years of activity, 371 male survivors have reached our, reached our services to seek support. In 2020, we registered an average of 10 new requests per month, which represents 20% uh, increase of, uh, compared to the previous year of 2019. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to say that um, the majority of the male survivors that, that come to Cabral Silencio when seeking support, the majority is the first time seeking help and it's the first time disclosing their abuse stories. We have uh, men with 20 years, but we also have men that around 40, 50, 60 and, and even 70 plus years that are uh, disclosing for the first time. So basically we have lots of men that uh, haven't found uh, a place that was secure or someone that was uh, secure for them to disclose their story. Normally it takes around 20 to 30 years to seek help and the age average of the male survivors who come to us is around 35. But like I said, not, we have male survivors from 16 up until 70 plus. Uh, some of the male survivors that reach us are in a crisis state um, or have developed harmful coping strategies and mechanisms. Um, and they contact us in different stages of preparation. Some, some of the male survivors are ready to start the counseling right away. Others need more time to think about that step. And this is crucial for us to respect the inner time uh, or the inner rhythm of each male survivor. Uh, from all the male survivors that have reached us, 75 have developed, developed PTSD. Next slide, please. Um, when we talk about the impact of, that sexual abuse can have on the male survivor's intimacy, I like to present this quote. Uh, for the survivor, the sexual situation appears to be where the most intense confusion, past and present occurs triggering flashbacks, body memories, and otherwise dissociated states in response of, to feelings of vulnerability and intimacy that are linked to specific physical sensations. I think this uh, quote summarizes in a in very clear way the relation between the trauma of sexual violence and intimate and sexual experiences. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and according to our experiences, experience, but also uh, according to what the literature says, there are some points that I would like to focus now a bit. 
Uh, I know that Atarit have already mentioned lots of things like hypersexuality, but I will. I think I will. We'll cross some of the points in common. So the first one is the belief or myth that the abuse was a sexual relationship or sexual experiences. We are. We normally say sexual violence is not sex; it's crime, and this is like an ongoing like mantra that we continue saying. As the abuse has a, con a sexual component to it, some survivors uh, may perceive uh, the sexual abuse as their first time, as their first sexual contact. Seeing as a sexual experiences also gives men a sense of control as if they had a word uh, to say about the abuse. Uh, but this is like a common uh, misconception. Um, because of this, sometimes uh, the male survivors may learn unhealthy sexual templates. When it happens, like at an early age, the experience of abuse can define some of the men's sexual experiences and normality. Uh, an abusive behavior can become an acceptable, acceptable behavior. For example, it's common for some men to think I can only have pleasure when associated with pain or my body is to be used by others and other ideas in this uh, same spectrum. Intimacy avoidance or hypersexuality is not unusual for survivors uh, to leave intimacy in one of these extremes, li like Atret said. Uh, either avoid the fear stimuli because it causes flashbacks and suffering and triggers lots of these uh, uh, symptoms or they use it to cope with anxiety and emotional distress. Uh, some men might even use it to cause self-harm. So we basically have some men that avoid all intimacy, whereas other men uh, might have uh, what is socially perceived as promiscuity behaviors. Um, presence of triggers in intimate contact. Physical intimacy can look in, uh, a, lot, a lot like how the abuse it did, so they might have some um, parallel effect. So the, the survivor's brain uh, reacts to, uh, to physical intimacy uh, and gets activated. As the abuse also generated uh, trust issues, this makes intimacy harder, and this might create the feeling that survivors can't trust no one or believe that anyone can and will hurt them, especially when people get more intimate. This can increase the state of being alert and the smallest sign can, of mistrust will activate the alarm. Um, homophobia or, and or sexual orientation questioning and doubts um, is also very present uh, during our support. Many times um, this is just motivated by social perception of what homosexuality is. Many survivors question themselves, uh, like, for example, if I'm a straight man, why did that man abuse me? Maybe I'm gay or maybe I have something feminine inside me and I cannot accept that, so I become disgusted at myself. So basically, it's something that sometimes it's easy to overcome, but either way, it's uh, something that is uh, common to many male survivors and also it's an obstacle to uh, seek support because uh, straight male survivors don't want to see perceived as uh, gay men. Anxiety, uh, especially regarding intimate and sexual experience. Um, intimacy and sexuality are associated with a traumatic event. So the victim, victim's body can react to it as the same as the traumatic event was. So it can make survivors anxious and scared uh, regarding this uh, sexual intimacy and normally ready to fight flight of freeze. Uh, anxiety uh, can also um, become an obstacle for, um, ah, sorry, I don't know this term in, in English. So, but, but basically performance issues, and, and this can also have, like Etheret said, is very tied in with the gender norms of what a, a man should be. So a man should always be prepared to have sex, never, can never say no 
uh, to a women to women so that kind of things of gender norm is also very tied in with this and then also uh, difficulty to trust other people usually the abuser is someone close to the survivor with whom they have they had or have a trustful and even caring relationship so when this abuser hurts the man or, or the child emotionally as well by turning this relationship they had into something shameful and bad the survivors can uh, learn that they cannot trust anyone so this is like um, transversal to all others next slide please just to summarize my the main points of my presentation sexual violence can have a traumatic impact on survivors lives namely on their intimate and sexual life the lack of information and social awareness can lead survivors to believe that they experience a bad sexual experience instead of sexual violence gender norms influence how male survivors deal with the impact of the abuse in their life and trauma focused therapy with a gender lenses is crucial to overcome the traumatic experience of the abuse many thanks for this opportunity and this is my presentation thank you angelo that was wonderful we really appreciate that our next speaker is dr richard gardner it is a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Gardner. We've known each other for many, many years. Well, we were just chatting right before the presentation. We said, wow, all these years we've been doing this work. Unfortunately, all these years we still need to be doing this work. Dr. Richard Gardner is a pioneer in treating sexually victimized men, having worked with these men for over 35 years. He is a trained analyst and founding director of the Sexual Abuse Service at the William Allison White Psychoanalytic Institute in New York City. Dr. Gardner has published numerous articles and six books about his work, including Betrayed as Boys, Understanding the Sexual Behavior of Boys and Men, and Healing Sexually, Abu uh, and Healing Sexually Betrayed Men and Boys. He is also a co-founder and president of MaleSurvivor.org. We welcome Richard. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephen. And uh, particularly thank you to the other panelists. Uh, you covered a lot of the ground that I will be covering as well. Hopefully I will have a little bit more to say. Maybe some of it I'll leave out. Um, since Male Survivor was... Um, mentioned, I, I will say malesurvivor.org is a, uh, a website that is very useful uh, for many male survivors who can um, uh, network there with other male survivors. Uh, survivors are often very isolated uh, and uh, they can network anonymously there. I'm not going to say anything more about that right now. Malesurvivor.org. So there are three ideas I want you to take away. Uh, from today about male sexual victimization. Um, one is masculine gender socialization. Two is feelings about homosexuality. And three is fears of becoming an abuser. I wanted to at least say all of those because I'm going to focus mainly on masculine gender socialization, but all three of them are important ideas. So it's important to think about how men and boys encode abuse. Sexually abused men often say the behavior was non-traumatic. However, these same men are more likely than non-abused men to enter psychotherapy for reasons that seem unrelated to abuse. And this is because of masculine gender socialization, which for many leads to what we uh, sometimes call the masculine masquerade on the one hand, or simply toxic masculinity on the other. Through masculine gender socialization, boys are told one way or another, be a man. So what does this mean? Uh, the slide for uh, cultural beliefs about men. Here are some conscious or unconscious cultural beliefs about real masculine men. I say real in quotes. One, men are always in charge of themselves in control. Men are competitive. Men are comp uh, competent and powerful. Men are mentally and physically tough. 
Men are resilient. Men are independent rather than needy. Men don't express emotions, as in big boys don't cry. Men are alexithymic, that is, they are unable to put emotions into words. Men welcome sexuality whenever it is offered, particularly from women. And finally, men must not be penetrated, violated, subdued, or otherwise forced into submission. Um, this list and the other one I'm gonna talk about will be available to you, so don't be too concerned if you missed some of it. Now, infant research suggests that socially constructed masculine ideals culminate in an ordeal of emotional socialization through which boys who start out life more emotional than girls learn to tune out, stifle, and channel their emotions. Through conforming to the ideal of not expressing emotion, men become strangers to their own emotional lives. They frequently channel their vulnerable emotions into anger and their caring emotions into sexuality. Now, some homophobic straight men believe that only homosexual men express emotion. And so they develop a kind of a stoic persona to confirm what they believe is their masculinity. Now understand that running through these perceptions of masculine gender identity are the usually unconscious views of masculinity as a good substance and femininity as a lack of that substance. If a man perceives himself as unmasculine or feminine, he sees himself as lacking an important and necessary positive element in his nature. Even men who rationally believe these values are artificial and damaging are nevertheless influenced by them, often enduring unconscious negative reactions if they have not upheld them. These are ideals are devastating to all men. The myth slide, please. So here are a number of myths, uh, some of which we've talked about, you've heard about before from other panelists. Um, these are masculine gender socialization then creates myths about male sexual victimization. First, that men cannot be sexually abused. Um, uh, two, that women do not abuse sexually. Sexual abuse is always overt, which is not true at all. It's often covert or um, in, in, in some way uh, un, undefinable in the moment. Uh, next, that only sissies and weaklings allow abuse. Children should be able to say no to abuse if violence is not used. If they don't, they must have wanted the abuse to occur. If a man, if a boy feels sexual arousal or a man, he is an equal participant in the abuse. That is an important myth, uh, particularly for uh, uh, straight men who feel uh, uh, aroused while they are being abused uh, by a man. Male victimizers who molest boys consider themselves gay and are interested sexually in other men, another myth. Next, victimizers are always conscious of the abuse they are committing. Sexual abuse turns a boy gay. That's a very difficult one for a lot of, a lot of men to, to, to get, come to terms with. And finally, sexually abused boys almost inevitably grow up to be sexually abusive men. This is a, a, a societal myth that turns out not to be true at all, but creates great difficulty for a lot of men who are sexually abused and believe that others will think that they are potential predators or whether they will think that themselves, even if they have no ideas about uh, uh, being a predator. Now, all these myths are supported in popular culture, movies, novels, comics. Masculine gender social stereotypes are basically anti-woman, and anti-gay. They express the horror a man is supposed to have about being receptive, capable of being penetrated. So their masculine identity is at stake in being identified as a victim because victimhood is identified as being female. And remember that even men who rationally believe these beliefs are damaging may feel bad about themselves if they don't live up to them. 
So treatment needs to question socialized gender norms uh, right there in the treatment of, of uh, question whether this is really what a man is. Sometimes there's a counterphobic reaction to feeling feminized by abuse. Um, these men become aggressive or you know, what we might call hyper-masculine. If they then become action-oriented rather than self-reflective, they are most likely to become abusive themselves. These action-oriented men are more likely to go to prison, whereas the more self-reflective men um, are more likely to come to a psychotherapist. Uh, a mitigating factor for such a bad outcome is the president, presence of a confidant as a boy. Whether or not the boy discloses his abuse to the confidant, he learns to use language to talk about personal emotional experiences. And this helps him become more self-reflective in all aspects of his life. So how boys encode abuse? To believe he is male, he must transform sexual victimization into something he sought and over which he therefore had mastery. So it wasn't really a victimization. It may be coded as sexual initiation, especially if the abuser is not a parent and is the same gender as the boy's eventual primary object choice, meaning if the abuser is, is um, um, male, if it's a, a boy who's uh, growing up to be gay, or female, if it's a, a boy growing up to be straight. Those are likely to see this as sexual initiation, at least at first. And I think I'm going to close with a quote from uh, President Obama, uh, American president in 2019. Quote, all of us have to recognize that being a man is first and foremost being a good human. That means being responsible, working hard, being kind, respectful, and compassionate. The notion that somehow defining yourself as a man is dependent on are you able to put someone else down, able to dominate, that is an old view. Well, I wish that were true, that it was an old view. It is still a view for many people, um, but what he's saying is something we should aspire to in, in our societies. Okay, thank you. I think that's all I'm going to say today. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that presentation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move into a panel discussion of, uh, to answer the Q&As that have come in. And not all the Q&As are addressed to a specific person. So I'm going to ask if all the panelists will uh, start your video and we'll ask you to unmute yourself when you want to answer the question. Maybe you could raise your hand or something if you're willing to take it. And there are a few that are directed to specific attendees. Okay. So the first question it has to do with ancient Greece and pedophilia was used uh, as a law by many men as accepted societal uh, norms and uh, wondering about how does that compare with blame and punishment? So if, if it's accepted in society, which unfortunately in some countries and in some por portions of our history, we have seen it be acceptable. How do we deal with that? How, how do we reconcile that it's okay sometimes some places? Will one of you answer that, please? Okay, I'd like to respond to that. I think a big part of the trauma is being betrayed. It's an interpersonal trauma, but also the secrecy involved. So with the ancient Greeks, secrecy was not necessary. It was part of society. That meant it was less traumatizing. It was an accepted part of life. Uh, there is a, a, a tribe that, that has been called the Sambians, it's not their real name, but uh, where adolescent boys are supposed to drink the, the uh, ejaculate of warriors as they become men. That, again, is no secret. Uh, and so for them, it, is not, it would be traumatic not to do that. 
So it becomes a whole different kind of behavior. But in most societies that we are living in, it is now no longer true. And so men do keep it a secret. Um, and that in itself is traumatizing, in addition to feeling betrayed rather than in some way honored by what happened uh, with this other person. I think if, the, if anybody wants to look it up, there is an article, I remember it was titled, The Seaman Warriors of New Guinea. That That's described it. exactly what Richard was uh, explaining about that tribe. Another part of the same person's question is, does every child, boy or girl, and I'll add in gender neutral, non-binary, does every child consider themselves a voluntary sexual uh, participant in the relationship? Even what if they're given money? What if they're offered uh, gifts? What if they accept this? Are they voluntarily participating or not? One of you, please I, take that. I can answer that too. Well, I, I defer to my co-panelists if they have something to say about this. Um, I, I think assent is not possible for a child. There is no way for a 12-year-old or even a 16-year-old to truly grasp what it means uh, in his life to be a part of this kind of um, uh, behavior. I have treated men who were trafficked as boys and some of them at the time thought it was fine. It was great, they got money, they were loved by their pimp, whatever it was. Um, but their lives were disastrous in adulthood, and they recognized that then. Remember that the brain doesn't develop full capacity to make this kind of a judgment, moral judgments, uh, until tw age 20 or 21. A question comes up about what exactly are we talking about? This is a common issue. Um, lots of times my experience is that sexual abuse survivors will come in the office and say, I've been sexually abused, I need help. And, well, what does that mean? Um, so the question is, what is, is there a continuum? But what exactly are we talking about when we talk about ch children being sexually abused? I'll talk again. Um, I, I think abuse happens when uh, a victimizer uses a power relationship to uh, get his own needs met or her own needs met without regard to the real needs of the child involved. And so that's what abuse is. They use sexual behavior to make a, uh, 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 to get a power um, uh, 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 advantage over the victim. Often it's not actually about sex at all. Angelo, could you answer some of this too? What do you see in the men that come into your clinic? What exactly has happened to them? Um, I would like to address that uh, when a male survivor comes, uh, like you said, Stephen, and asks for help, this, this could be like a, a big world of, of, of stuff happening, but I think in general is I want help to overcome this, these feelings I have of guilt, of shame, and also um, feeling stranded uh, on the trauma because somehow they feel the trauma doesn't let the, them uh, get on with their lives. Um, and, and for example, uh, I've, there's one one topic uh, that is interesting to, to to explore for example when male survivors become parents or their child is reaching a certain age that is more or less the age when they were they were abused and they they want they, they say what's the time i want to be a good parent uh, i want to be um, a clear-minded parent because this is the abuse keeps assaulting my mind uh, so they want to become free of the abuse in order to become a better man, to become a better 
parent as well. So basically, I, I think like, this is a very uh, short answer, of course, but I think when they ask for help is, can you help me overcome the impact that, the, on, that the abuse had on my life? Even though, even if they don't, even even if they don't pinpoint exactly what the impact is, they feel it's um, uh, pushing them back. And then that's our job to, with psychoeducation and, and the other stuff, to make it clear uh, how the abuse impact their lives and how to overcome. Patrick, do you want to add to this question? What is it specifically we're talking about? What is sexual abuse? So I think I think this is a good case when someone comes in and says, "I need help." I think they're at a good stage as a as a sex therapist in a couple and that I see couples. Many times, the woman drags or the cup or the man drags their partner in, and they have marital issues. Uh, sexual difficulties and then I, and then we find out that there is an abuse in the in the background there's a history of an abuse so that that is also something we need to consider that sometimes couples come in and there is a gap or between what they say their issues are and then you find out there is a history of abuse that that's I, I agree with Angelo. That's how shame ashamed they feel, embarrassed, and a lot of times it also I'm connecting to couple therapy. A lot of times they also will just admit to the history when the their partner is not in a therapeutic session. So that's also something they didn't I, disclose it to their partner. I'd like to add to that some specifics. So um, it depends partly on the dynamic, but for the most part, what we're talking about is unwanted sex, which means lack of consent. And sex can include oral sex, getting and receiving, um, giving it, touching somebody's genitals, having somebody touch your genitals if you're the, the, the victim. Um, definitely any kind of penetration, and it can be penetration with a penis, a finger, a tongue. It can be penetration with a foreign object. Um, also, exposing a child to uh, inappropriate sexual material can be considered child sexual abuse. One area that people frequently miss is what if you have a child, what if you photograph a child and turn that into pornography. The child may not ever even know that they were a victim, but that is a victim of sexual abuse. And that it happens by men and women, boys, girls, many kinds of dynamics. So there is a question about what I just said though, somebody's asking, is there a difference in the effects or the symptoms that we see in our patients if they were sexually abused at different ages? What happens to a infant or toddler who grows up who has been sexually abused? What if the abuse doesn't happen until adolescence? So I, I can answer that. Um, so there's mixed method, there's mixed results on that. Um, some studies, that's one of the problems in research on, on child on sexuality following child sexual abuse. What is child sexual abuse? The the you, you gave a long list. So the thing is that it's usually considered under the age of 18. So we don't have much um, data uh, and understanding about what if it happens at the age of five and at the age of 12 or 16. But um, there's mixed results. Some show that when you're younger, it it's affects your sexuality much more. And others, other studies say that actually when you understand more and adolescence, it's and it's harder. It, the effect is is stronger. And I, I could connect it to a child pornography that is child sexual abuse that is photographed. So sometimes they see a video. They don't even remember the abuse, but then they see a video when they're older. And child sexual abuse that was filmed usually has a very dif very difficult effect. Very harmful effect because survivors talk about ongoing abuse 
the video is always there and it feels like an ongoing trauma. Yes, I, 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 just if I may add, uh, what Atherod said, I is think it, it connects with one thing, which is the loss of control. Because if a MERV survivor uh, that was filmed and that movie is on the internet, he doesn't know when, where the movie is, who is actually seeing it. And also uh, if one day this video might come back and somehow uh, affects his current life. So the abuse is always a, a loss of power and control, especially control. And this is an ongoing reminder that uh, something is out of your control. So it might be um, what, a looping idea that someone somewhere could, could be watching your movie, your movie, no, the, the movie that was done to you when you were five, six, and whatever. So this could be uh, something that could uh, strengthen the, the, the male survivor on this very uh, aspect of the abuse. They also feel very much exposed. They say, these survivors say, I won't even go to the grocery shop, nonetheless yeah. run for office or anything public because someone's gonna recognize it. And if someone yeah. in the street says, oh, you look familiar, that is the biggest trigger for. And, and, also, and also even the, the, just the idea of being shot, because for example, imagine um, a raped drug and a male survivor is raped or, with the, the use of drugs and it doesn't know because it, it was blacked out uh, if it was or no, shot or not. So it doesn't know for sure uh, because might be, uh, it's everyone today with a cell phone can record a movie. So um, he wakes up and, and he's not sure if that the rape piece was shot or no. So what happens to that video? So we, we know that this is, could also be an idea that uh, endures. Thank you. Another common question that's coming up here is uh, attendees want to know what's the difference or is there a difference if a boy is molested by a female as opposed to if they're molested by a male? Richard, do you want to answer that? Uh, yes. Um, I think it, it, part of it depends on whether they are a boy who is on their way to becoming gay or becoming straight. And I'm, I'm using it as a binary, even though we all know that's not exactly right. But um, a, a, uh, a, a straight boy abused by a woman or a gay boy uh, abused by, by a man are much more likely to see it as a positive a sexual awakening uh, gay men have told me that that's exactly what it was, that they were delighted to have been found by some older man and introduced into sex. But what they didn't get for a long time is that they were also introduced to the idea that sex is secretive. Uh, uh, you can't tell anybody about it because you'll get me in trouble, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, in, in some way dirty and it has to be done in the dark. And um, uh, and also that it takes them away from their adolescence, uh, for, say for an adolescent boy. A similar question that comes up is, is there a difference between male, female, or transgendered providers? So if you're the therapist, if you're working with a male, will a male respond differently to a female therapist as opposed to a male therapist? Angela? No, I thought it was speaking first. No, I just think it's very, it very much depends on what was the identity of the perpetrator. What do you think about that identity now? Or do you think that all men are that, all men are abusers, all women are, are dangerous? Um, and, and the transference, like what happens within therapy? What are you seeking? Are you, are you looking for what are you seeking when you look when you go for therapy? So I think I think there's no specific answer about the gender, but it's it's something I usually ask, like if someone wanted a female therapist or a male therapist, and why? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question because there's one one uh, aspect we always we were always debating um, in our uh, organization. And the ideal is for a survivor to, to, uh, to choose uh, who's more comfortable with. 
Um, but we have to keep in mind that triggers, for example, can come in any shape or form. So we, we never know during a session that something you might say or something you might do, uh, for example, um, a cloth or a, 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 a smell, for example, can trigger the, the survivor without even knowing. So, so yes, that's an issue, but we, we, this is always a minefield in that way that something that might be a trigger for a male survivor is not for the, uh, another one. So we have to be aware that this might happen, but yeah. The, the perfect, I, no, the ideal scenario is for uh, the, the, the survivor to choose who, who's more comfortable with. Right. And I'm going to add to that, that there's an important issue here, though, that we've talked about. And that is that we don't have providers in every state in the United States. We don't have providers in every country on this planet for male survivors. So here in California, where we have a very large population, for many years, we had no provider for male survivors in the whole entire Los Angeles area. And a female therapist asked me, could she do it? <laughs> Absolutely, guys would rather have a therapist who's willing to work with you than no therapist. Richard? Uh, yeah, uh, just to, to uh, underline some of the dynamics here, uh, men can say, I only can talk to a woman because I'd be too ashamed to say to a man that I've done this sort of thing. That's sort of their mindset when they're entering therapy. But another man may say exactly the opposite. I'm too ashamed to tell a woman that I've done these terrible things. And I think you have to start with where a person is, if it's possible. If not, then I think the therapist, you know, has to keep in mind that there are a lot of um, issues that are going to come up that need to be addressed. That's if the man is even willing to see them. A question that a lot of people are asking, this is a very common question. Is it once a victim, always a victim? Or can people actually become survivors? Can they ever get over the trauma? Eritrea? So there is, I I think as any trauma, there is a lot of research also on post-traumatic growth. And I usually refer to them as survivors. Um, and there is even, I saw not much, but a little research on how they kind of incorporated this, the abuse into their sexual self-esteem, their, their sexual, their, their identity, their, and then they, they overcome it. I mean, there is, there is, I think it's like, you can never always absolutely heal, but there's a, but there is repairment and, and you can, you can incorporate it and in, into your, into your life and, and become a survivor. Definitely. I don't like the word victim. I don't, I don't know if you use it, uh, <laughs> we, we stopped using it. In, in, in Portugal, uh, there, the word survivor is not commonly accepted yet. Um, and uh, most of the people were use victims, although uh, the victim has a, a very negative um, you, uh, attached to it, okay? It's like uh, someone who is um, very fragile, can't help themselves, so on, so on. Uh, I think it's important for uh, the survivors or victims to choose the term they feel more comfortable with. We have male survivors that don't like the term victims, but we also have uh, men that don't like the term survivors. So I think it's important to, to acknowledge that and also to work with that. Why doesn't he identify himself as a victim or as a survivor? So what's behind that? So either way you use a victim or survivor, I think it's important to understand what's the, the, the resistance between choosing one or the other and then working it out. For This is just one part. And then the, maj the majority of male survivors that seek us, in the end, they accept this survivor. I'm a survivor now. I, I, I'm, 
I came as a victim, but now I live as a survivor. I think it's a, a, a empowerment, but it must um, make sense on, on, on themselves to accept this. And, and this is something that we have to, to, to be aware. I'd like to have Richard answer that question as well. I do want to just point out, though, it's, it is the top of the hour. We have so many questions. So we're going to go for about 10 more minutes. If you can all hang in there with us, we appreciate that. We get to as many as we can. Richard? Okay, well, uh, I, I agree with everything that, that uh, you both said. But there is a third kind of guy who doesn't want to be identified as either a victim or a survivor. He's willing perhaps to call himself a man with a history of sexual abuse, which of course is what he is. Um, and I tell people about when they're talking about, can I be healed? Um, I say, you will never not have been sexually abused. That's part of your history. What can happen though, is that it's not center stage in your life so that the spotlight is always on it and defining everything you do. You can put it on the side of the stage of your life and it can and come out occasionally, but it'll mainly be like perhaps the broken arm you had when you were 12 years old. You remember it, it was traumatic, but you don't think about it a whole lot. That's what I would call um, a, a very good outcome. Another area that's commonly questioned is what's the difference if if somebody, if a boy is molested by, let's say, his mother, as opposed to his priest, what about if it's a school teacher? What if it's a, a stranger? How do we how do we see the differences there? I think I think that when you are perpetrated by someone who was close to you, so the identity is really important because if it was someone that was close to you, so the the chances of it developing into an attachment trauma increases because you had you trusted that person and he was supposed to protect you. So usually that is, I don't like to say more difficult or less difficult because it's a very subjective experience, but it adds another layer of attachment trauma that usually requires that usually needs to be addressed within therapy. That's how I see it. Richard? Uh, well, I think it goes back to the issue and Ateta is, is, is really talking about this, um, of betrayal. And a betrayal by a trusted caretaker is always going to be um, more traumatic than say by a stranger. Um, I say always, you know, every case is different, but I think in general, that's true. Uh, sorry. Um, and um, so that's, uh, that, you know, that, that's where I look at it. Now, of course, if you were abused by your mother or your father, that means you grew up in a family that somehow supported a, a very twisted relationship with at least one of your primary caretakers. And that's going to have a lifelong effect on you that, you know, that's much more difficult than say, uh, uh, if it was your scoutmaster or, or some kid at camp. Um, so that's what I'd say. Angela, would you like to answer that as well, please? Sorry, I was unmuting. <laughs> yeah, um, I think the, I think we have two, two things here uh, to consider, mainly. One, I think it was already said, which is the, um, the relationship that the abuser has with the victim. So, for example, a parent, a caregiver has more attachment to it. So, um, and that can have a real impact. But also, maybe, let's say, a priest or... Uh, uh, but, um, which doesn't have the same role um, or influence on the victim's life, but the, the grooming is also very important. And also if the, the physical aspect is, if it's violent or way violent, could also uh, increase the traumatic level uh, into the, uh, the child. So we, I think we have to consider the, the relationship and the 
um, the relation between the abuser with the child, parents, for example, high level, and then also the, the grooming and the physical violence attached to it. Uh, we have so many great questions. We're not going to be able to get to all of them. I'd like to change the topic a little bit, though, from what do we see in our office to what can our attendees do about this? Um, if they want to learn more about working with male survivors, what can they do as far as uh, cultural differences? How can they recognize abuse? What, what if they think somebody's being abused in their office, but they're not talking about it. so many questions about those kinds of things. If we can take a stab at one or two of them, please. That's right. What can you speak about like in Israel? What, what do people see there and how would they get training if they want to get, if they want to get in this field? I'm trying to, I need to think about it. I need to process it. Maybe. Okay, we'll come back to you. Angelo, can you answer that question, please? Um, yeah, that's a very complex answer. <laughs> but uh, a couple of ideas is it's not possible to put like a a lenses and, and spot on uh, spot the male survivors. And when I'm normally on training, I normally say um, that we cannot identify by the, the clothes we wear, the, the way we act, that that person may have or may have not been a victim of sexual violence. Having that said, um, it's important to, to uh, become aware on the impact of what we say have on other people because we don't know how, for example, you said in the beginning, one in every six men were abused. So for example, when we are talking in big, uh, 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 venues, when we talk about the one in six, it's normal to see some men counting how many men are in the, the room and, and say, okay, if we are 20 here, maybe one or two men have been uh, abused. So what I say normally is, uh, we don't know who have been abused, but I know that my words and my uh, behaviors can uh, prolong uh, the silence of the male uh, survivors. Whenever we make fun uh, about m uh, men and boys being abused uh, whenever we we say only gay men are abused or if you were abused you will become gay or you will become an abuser all of those myths that Richard uh, um, focused so this is our responsibility okay so this is one of the things that I start saying because one of the things I also say is if you think about an um, x-ray, an, an emotional x-ray, uh, and I normally say, if you meet a, a, a survivor and you don't know he is a, a survivor, and I ask you, for example, to tell me how he is, you might say he's very assertive, he's like, he, he plays in a band, he's a CEO of a, a big company, uh, he's always uh, playful, cheerful, assertive, very high, high esteem. But maybe his internal um, self, his internal reality is not the reality that you have access, for example. So maybe that, that man that you know, that you consider very assertive and I esteem very good professional, maybe inside he feels still the same child that was sexual abused with low self-esteem, uh, auto depreciation, depre 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 sorry, not bad English. <laughs> And, and all of those symptoms um, that are tied with, for example, PTSD. So those are the, some of the things that I normally try uh, to start off this conversation for me. Uh, I would add that. I'm gonna add something too. Okay, go ahead, okay, go ahead both of you, please. I kind of, you asked me about Israel. So Israel is, is a very super, I would say hyper-masculine. <laughs> um, Society, we have uh, all men going to the army, and that's a that's a big, big issue here. I think I think it's over a hyper masculine uh, society. So what what I usually say to therapists and to students is to kind of like examine their own attitudes because we are living in a society, and each culture has their norms about what how men should behave, how women should behave, how brave men should be. And in Israel, they have to be very brave. 
Um, so I think I just, I ask them, please reflect on what you think about what are your attitudes, what are your myths on men, on women, and bring them up in, within, gu within guidance and, and try and challenge them a bit, a bit. So we're not biased. Richard? Well, um, when I first began speaking about this in, in professional settings in the mid 90s, I would start by asking the audience, uh, how many of you have somebody, uh, a man in your practice who was sexually abused as a boy? And I might get one or two hands raised in a group of a hundred. Uh, and then I would follow it up with how many of the rest of you ever asked? And there would be this sort of appreciative murmur. These days, when I, when I ask those same questions, it looks a little different. Um, uh, uh, when I first began talking, I think a lot of professionals believed it was a kind of a hoax that this was a, 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 a matter of importance to, uh, to, to people. So um, what I, and there's more available to therapists now than certainly than there was in the 90s. Uh, so I would say go online and look for seminars, uh, webinars like this, they do exist. Um, uh, do all the reading you can. Um, there are a number of books that can be very helpful, my own included, but there's also books by uh, Mike Liu, uh, Mick Hunter. Um, those are mainly for survivors, but they can still be helpful. Uh, one of mine is like that too. Um, and, uh, and then tr uh, if you can, work out uh, some kind of a, a peer supervision group, or you know, if you can find a supervisor who is more experienced, uh, you know, work with that person. And of course, now it can be done uh, remotely. So you have, you know, many more possibilities. Um, the more you're able to talk about the work you're doing with other people, uh, with other professionals who are doing the work, you know, the better off you're likely to be. And going back to the question of, you know, how many of you ever asked, it's important what you ask. Part of the reason that the research is uh, a little complicated is that in the, the researchers who asked men if they were ever sexually abused got very low numbers. For all the reasons I said, men don't want to say I was abused. They don't want to say I was a victim. But if you ask about specific kinds of experiences they might have had, and you somehow give off, and I can't tell you how, give off that you are receptive and that you're not gonna be judgmental, they'll tell you. Thank you, Richard. So we have so many more questions. We could probably go on for weeks answering these. However, we can't, we are out of time. I wanna thank all of our panelists and for all of our attendees with all the rest of the questions you have, reach out to us. We are all glad to answer questions. We're glad to help in any way, shape, or form. And of course, through the ISSM, you'll find links to uh, contact us. I'd like to turn this back to Anna Maria and thank everybody for coming today. Thank you, Stephen. And first of all, thank you for to the faculty. I think you did a wonderful job. We learned so much and we can see from all the questions that people really, really are eager to learn more about this topic, which has a very profound effect on, on the men's life that, that we're talking about. And thank you to you, Stephen, for moderating this. So I just really want to give you a big thank for participating and share all your knowledge. And I also want to thank all the participants. We have had more than 200 people participating. And I just want to put your focus on our next webinar, which will be May the 27th, and it will be on testosterone abuse and sexual health. So thank you to all of you and stay safe and have a nice evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. So thank you very much.